let's get started. So we are happy to have Carl and Rikek today. Uh, he came a couple of years ago, probably not last year, it was not possible, but uh, and uh, he's now, uh, since he came, is uh, now has a position uh, in Cambridge in the new Cambridge Computer Science Hub. Correct me later if that's not the right name. Uh, and before that, he was lecturer in Bristol. I will introduce him for what I know about his work, which he, his work on Gaussian process, part of the Gaussian process mafia. Um, and uh, today he's going to talk to us about um, probabilistic numerics and applications to Bayesian optimization. And uh, I leave it the microphone to you now. Uh, thank you very much, Vincent. So it's a really nice, it's really nice to be invited to come and give a talk. So the nice thing about talking to you guys uh, is that I don't have to explain anything about Bayesian optimization. So now the thing is, you work on Bayesian optimization. I lecture on Bayesian optimization. So why I really like Bayesian optimization is that I can show images like this. And this is the first time my students actually understand why you should care about uncertainty, right? We like these nice smooth functions, we do acquisitions, we talk about exploration, exploitation, and the world is really nice, right? And people get why you should actually care about uncertainty for decision processes. So let's now take a slightly different function. So let's take a function that looks like this. Okay, I have the same query points on this. So I get this nice acquisition function in magenta under. This is gonna work really well. So in my loop, I'm probably gonna do some posterior inference of the kernel parameters. So I'm gonna find something like this. I get an even nicer structure to find the minima and everything's dandy, right? So however, what I could have gotten, I could have gotten a sample on the other side of this discontinuity. Right? And now if I would have fitted my model to this, it would have looked like this, and my acquisition wouldn't have been at all as informative as I wanted it, right? So in this case, it's basically model mismatch. And if I would, in this case, do posterior inference over the parameters of the covariance, I would probably end up with something looking like this. So I'm pretty bad, much back to random search, right? So this is not what we want. And the thing that we have is that we have some form of model mismatch. And what I want to get to, and what my point of the talk really is, is that the thing that really ruins this thing for us is this point here. So this point is just not, not informative about the minima because we have model mismatch. It's actually destructive to get this. Actually, we're better off not knowing this point. And that's what we're gonna try and address in the talk that I'm uh, gonna give today. And what does this lead to when we have these issues? Well, what it leads to is something that I think is really bad in practice. So if we look at these typical regret plots that we see in Bayesian optimization papers, this variance here, which is, effectively how well does this specific algorithm do after a certain set of uh, see having seen a certain set of observations this is a really really annoying thing to have in practice right if i have such a large variance over the different runs because of different random restarts because i ended up getting the wrong data into my model then i can't trust the results i get what I would much rather want to have is to have a small variance on my model so that I end up and I can reasonably trust the results that I get out. And that's what we're going to try and talk about today, or models that try to address this concept. So what I'm going to do, what this talk is going to be about, is that I'm going to talk a bit and take a probabilistic numerics view of Bayesian optimization. And I'm going to try and explain why Bayesian optimization isn't probabilistic numerics and what we're actually missing in order to have a proper model-based treatment of Bayesian optimization. And I'm going to try and do this through something which is going to be a massive abuse of notation. 
So I'm going to show something that looks like graphical models. These are not graphical models. These are more computational structures. So don't think about the things that I draw as graphical models, because then things are going to go slightly wrong. So I'm going to draw up what I think is a little bit of a bigger picture. And then I'm going to present this paper called Modulated Surrogates for Bayesian Optimization, which aims to address some of the issues that I highlighted before. So some inspirational papers uh, that basically underlie some of the notions of this work. Especially, I would like to highlight these two papers. So Oates, a modern retrospective on probabilistic numerics. I think everyone should read this paper. It's a fantastic paper because it provides a history of probabilistic numeric um, probabilistic numerics. And what it really does is that it provides a layman's explanation of what this paper from 2017 by John Coquet. This is a really, really nice paper, uh, but it's a little bit dense and hard to get through. And this paper provides a much, much simpler narrative, basically the narrative that's needed for the talk that I'm supposed to give or that I'm giving today. So, the idea that John Cocaine draws up of what is a probabilistic numerics method, I'm going to extend this notion and talk about machine learning in general as this. So what we have is that, and this is the thing that's not a graphical model. It's drawn as a graphical model, but it's not. So don't interpret it as this. So what I have is that I got the world. This is the world follows some form of distribution. Okay. Then I have some quantity of interest, which I'm going to call f hat. Then I have an operator that takes the knowledge I have about the world and it generates this quantity of interest. If we think about machine learning, this would be if I have the joint distribution of everything, then this quantity of interest operator would be, for example, learning a conditional by right? picking out one of the conditionals from the joint distribution. Now, the thing is, in machine learning, we do not have this object, right? So what we instead have is that we have a set of finite samples from this. I'm going to call this calligraph S. So this is what I have. Sometimes I have access to the operator which generates the samples, right? Sometimes I don't. Sometimes I'm given a set of training data, do the best you can. Sometimes I'm allowed to query data. So S is my operator that generates the data. So as machine learners, what our task really is, is to design an algorithm that takes this finite sample set and derives the quantity of interest, right? That's what we aim to do. So we're trying to make this graph commute. So the example that's often given in probabilistic numerics is something like this, right? So I have a function, that's unknown, it's latent. And this I want to compute the integral of. So now, if I knew this function, I could potentially compute its integral. That's my quantity of interest. But now what I do is that I don't. I only have samples from this. And then I come up with some form of rule, some form of quadrature rule that calculates this from these samples. The nice thing in the probabilistic framework world is that by making different assumptions about F, you can derive optimal sampling schemes, and you can also potentially derive optimal algorithms, right? That's the really nice idea. Okay, so what happens if we take and generalize this again and think about machine learning as a whole? So what we often do, especially, I think, for people who come from, um, no, I don't like saying Bayesian, but if you, if you think in a Bayesian manner about the world, so what you would often do is that you say, okay, so I have this latent, this distribution, my full, complete knowledge about the world. I don't have this. Now I have these samples from it instead. So what do I try to do? Well, what I try to do is that I try to build a surrogate 
model, I try to build an approximation of this world from the sample data that I have. And if I can do that, the quantity of interest, the quantity of interest operator can then be applied to this, and I can get my quantity of interest. Right? So this would just be saying, I have some data, I try to learn the joint distribution, and then I apply base rule, and I try to get the quantity that I'm interested in. Okay? So the other way of thinking about it is to say, well, actually, screw this. I'm not caring about modeling the full complete joint. I'm going to go directly and try and approximate the quantity of interest that I'm interested in. So how do these two things differ? Right. So in the first place, if I try to model a surrogate that describes everything, I'm modeling a very large object. And that's beneficial because that means I have the potential to have a lot of prior knowledge about this. So I can constrain the problem a lot more. And this is good. But the negative side is I'm modeling a very complicated and large object, which means potentially it's mathematically very hard. On the other side of things, if I don't care about modeling the joint distribution, I often have a much more simple algorithmical problem, but I can't use as much prior information, which implies I have to trade that off with data. So now we're going to talk about Bayesian optimization. So we already know that we're in a scenario where we want to minimize the amount of data that we use. So we're going to go along this route. So let's then think about minimization, because that's what we're actually interested in doing. So I have this unknown function f, and we say that I'm going to create this algorithm that creates and tries to learn the whole function and then when I've learned the whole function, I try to minimize it. So this seems to be a little bit of overkill, right? Because what I'm effectively doing is I'm learning every characteristic of the function, and then I just pick out one of them, right? There's a lot of things which are unnecessary for the minima in the function. And should I really spend time modeling them? Well, we don't actually do this. We never do this, because when we do Bayesian modeling, there is this additional thing which we should give a little bit more respect. And that's our likelihood function, right? So what is the likelihood? Well, the likelihood is a special conditional distribution that actually tells you where, what part of the model is important to describe because this is where you add in your quantity of interest. So if we go back then and look at this graph, in this setting, now I know exactly the behavior that I want. Now I have the object here, which tells me, you know, this is everything about the function. So this allows me to put in all the prior information that I have so that I can be data efficient. However, by adding this likelihood function, that gives me now a means of quantifying what of this is important for finding the quantity of interest that I want. So great. So let's then think about minimization again of this function. What would the likelihood function be for minimization? Well, I don't know. And I can tell you two things that I wish I knew. I wish I knew likelihoods for reinforcement learning and for minimization. Because if that was true, these two tasks would just be Bayesian inference, nothing else. Right? If we think about the reinforcement learning system, the way it's set up right, is that I got some form of system. I got the distribution and some priors about the policy and the dynamics. And then I can evaluate trajectories so that I get a value function. If I now have the likelihood that tells me how informative is this value function for the optimal value function, Cool, this is just Bayesian optimized. Oh, this is just Bayesian inference. And the same thing would go for Bayesian optimization. But now we don't have this object. So then we do something else, right? And in Bayesian optimization, what we do is that we exploit the fact of having a non parametric model. So what we're actually doing is that we're saying, I have some data, and then I learn the function. When I do posterior inference over the hyperparameters, 
In this case, everything is equally important. I'm just trying to learn the function, right? It has nothing to do with the minima. And then we're using the ID or the usefulness of having the parameterization of the function to be non-parametric to then derive our acquisition function, which then cleverly adds data points that we believe are informative for the minima. But in this step here, we're only modeling the function, right? And that's where things go wrong, right? That's exactly the example that I showed in the beginning. When I add in this value, which is actually detrimental for finding the minima because I have model mismatch, then we're still modeling it equally as it's equally important as everything else. Cool. So this is, yeah, this is what I was supposed to say here. So now, I'm going to come to the meat of this talk to actually explain an algorithm or a different type of surrogate model that's actually motivated by these things that I drew up before. And this work is really done by Eric Bodin, who is was a PhD student, or he's defending in two weeks or a week, and is now a postdoc at ATI. Genwin Dai, who is at Spotify, and Marcus Kaiser and Yeva, who is both at Cambridge as postdocs, and Neil Campbell, who's a lecturer in Bath. Cool. So now I'm then going to introduce the concept of modulated surrogates as a means to circumvent some of the problems that we had before and try and push Bayesian optimization to become more of a probabilistic numerics algorithm. Great. So the ideas that underpins this work is basically this. So when we have a model mismatch, the utility notion of the acquisition function kind of falls. So the acquisition function or the utility that's described in the acquisition function will work if I have the right model. If I don't have the right model, we know that this doesn't do what we want it to. So the first natural notion is to then increase model complexity so that I have a surrogate which is more complicated so I don't suffer from model mismatch. But then I usually have, because I have a more complex, I have a larger class of surrogates, now that leads to me using more data. And that's something that I don't want. So instead, we're going to accept that we will always have model mismatch. This is just something that we have, and we're going to deal with it. And then we're going to say, actually, the key point is that even though we can't add this likelihood function in, we are going to try to take the notion that we don't care about everything in the function. We only care about modeling the function up to the point where it's informative for the extreme. So as we can't specify a likelihood, because we believe this is really hard, we have to circumvent this somehow. And the way we're going to do this is that we're going to specify a prior or a surrogate model over some smaller object where smaller is really within quotation marks at the moment. Uh, we will come to what that means. So the idea is this. So in the ideal case that I had before, I had a distribution or I had a model of the function and then I had a likelihood. We can't do this, but what we're going to do is to replace the model of the function with another function. So a slightly different function called G. And we'll come to how we parameterize G. And we're going to parameterize G in such a way so that the utility, when we define the acquisition function, becomes informative for search. So even though G is not F, G, the structure of G, is such that it's useful for search of the minima in F. Okay? So. People have thought about this before, uh, and I'm just going to mention two works that I think are really, really nice that are doing this. This is a paper by Ricardo Morricone and Mark Dysonroff uh, from last year, I think. 
So here they do base opt on very, very high dimensional data. And the thing they do is they say, well, actually, we don't want to model this very high dimensional surface. So what we're going to do is we're going to take projections of the data. So on the left hand side here, you have to think about these plots is actually some high dimensional surface. And this is the projection down on one axis. And what they then do is they say, now we're going to fit a Gaussian process with a quantile likelihood function. So now we're going to fit the lower part of this instead. So now you're actually not describing the surface, but you're actually describing these projections of the surface instead. And this turns out is a much better informative structure for the search. Another paper that I believe I have most of the authors in this talk is this paper. Ordinal Bayesian optimization. I think this is a super nice paper because it's taking the same approach or the same philosophy that I think I've been trying to describe of saying what, I don't want to model the function, what is the informative structure in the function that is useful for me to search? And here then saying, well, actually, it's the order of the data points in X and Y. And now I learn a function where I'm allowed to transform this, and then my search works much better. And my gut feeling is, correct me if I'm wrong, I hope to discuss this later, this works really well in practice. This is at least what I've, correct me if I'm wrong, but I really like this paper. Cool. So we're going to do this slightly differently. So we are going to try and specify a prior over the relevant structure of the function. So by what we mean by relevant is how you should search. So what is relevant information to feed to the acquisition function? So effectively, we are specifying a prior on how you should search, not what the function is. And because we want to do models, we need to parameterize the things that we find irrelevant so that we can explain it away when we do decisions, when we feed it in to uh, the acquisition function. We need a parameterization of we believe, what we believe to be irrelevant. And second important thing is that the information content in each point on the parts of the function that we've observed changes over the active learning loop. Something that could have been very informative initially could become detrimental later on in the loop. And then we need to be able to somehow quantify this during optimization. So we're going to formulate a simple class of surrogates, which we then refer to as these modulated surrogates, where we have our true objective function, f. So this is the thing we can sample from over the domain x. And what we're going to say is that we are going to model this as another function called g, which is over x, and it has an additional input h. And we want g to follow the structure. G is the thing that we specify our prior over, over how we should search. And h is the thing that picks up the slack from g, right? So that it matches f. So very you know, traditional, simple things fits this, right? You can think of an additive noise model where you just make h, use something that you add on top of g. You can have additive input noise. This is starting to become as half the ordinal paper. Or you can have an additive function, right? The key thing here is that you learn h, and then you remove h, and you chuck g into your acquisition function. OK? So how are we going to parameterize this? Well, the way we're going to parameterize this is at what we call a latent Gaussian process. So just a very simple notion of this, right? So let's say I have this function. So this is f over x. And I want to describe this using a uh, stationary covariance function. This function is not stationary, right? 
So what I can do is that instead of modeling it here, I can add an additional latent variable like this. So in this case, this will be x, this will be h. And then I can turn this function into something that's stationary. So I model g over here, right? So basically, h in this case is a free variable that now allows me to use the prior that I set initially. So people have used this a lot, uh, these kind of IDs. We've used them for doing things like heteroscedastic noise. We've done it for using things like regression on something that looks like this, which is non-functional. And I know that Vincent has done some work on this. Hugh has done some work on this. Fariba Yousefi used these kind of structures to do um, classification from biased data sets. So this is a really useful technique, right? So what do we want this additional latent variable to be in this case, right? This is the key thing. What do we want it to explain away? So we're going to do something very simple. We are going to say that we are going to specify GP prior over X and H. So the product space of X and H is going to be my kernel. And we specify G here now as the function that we want to use for search. Okay. So H now is a latent variable that modulates the input G in some way to make G well-behaved. And well-behaved means that it fits the prior that we started off with. So now, what do we want H to represent? So this is really the key thing, right? I can put any H to basically make this function fit the prior. But what do I want H to represent? Well, Think about what the acquisition function actually means. So the acquisition function is defined from the concept of utility of sampling in this location. So we're defining what is the use for me to querying at this location. So what is it then that I want to explain away? Well, I want to explain away the information that cannot be reduced by additional samples in this location. So with that notion, we are gonna define H as a free random variable where each H, there's an H corresponding to each X I observe, where each H is independent, right? So that means that if I've observed a certain set of location, they contain no value for the H's next me, right? the ones I haven't observed. Right? So that means I cannot gain information by getting additional samples in that region. So what we're then going to do is that if we now, to get this to the acquisition function, I see some data. Now I perform posterior inference over H for the data I've seen. So H is associated with the Xs of the locations that I currently see. Now, I have defined this surface G. Now, every slice of this surface G specifies a particular posterior function over all the Xs. To show you what that means, this is a set of slices of this. So you, you, to get an ID, and this is a good point to stop me so that we just get an intuition what this means. So to fit this function, what has effectively happened in the H space, right, is we got this discontinuity, and what it's done is that it's pulled this discontinuity apart, right? So it's made this point and this point really, really far away from each other. So let's say that these ones have really high positive H's, and these ones have really high net or small, big negative H's. So that means that these don't co-vary. If I now then pick a slice of H, which is H is large negative, then I get this posterior over X. So that means this point is very important, and I should keep this one. 
So this one influences the curve a lot, while these now doesn't influence it at all. They basically explain the way. Does this make sense? Cool. So basically you just bend this curve like this, right? Can I Rick? Right. Yeah. Uh, how do you make a prediction with this model for a point that you have not observed yet? So uh, this is, so the way you make this prediction, right? So is in each of these slices, have, you have a fixed age. So effectively, your model looks like this, right? So now I don't know what age is, right? Because age is this, but I can do posterior inference over age. So I can actually get the ages which is associated with the training data, right? Now, what is the age for an unobserved data point? Well, I don't know. And this is a slice when I've fixed age. Right? Each of these slices corresponds to a specific fixed age. So you can think yeah. about this thing, right? It's put the data like this, and now you have this surface that goes like this. And yeah, then I just, yeah? Yeah, my question was, if I give you a new value of x, what prediction are you going to return? Because you don't know. No, exactly, I don't, right? I, I, I don't know. I can, I can return any of these at the moment. This is the next okay. step. This okay. is the next okay. step. So, 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 so basically, the, the only thing I want you to get to at this point, right, is that we have a function class now, which allows to choose, oh, actually, I'm going to just going to use this part of the data, or I'm just going to use this part of the data. But I don't know which one I should choose yet, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, cool. So the natural thing, right? So, so what I basically wanted to get to <laughs> was what I just said. It's like, this, I really like this, right? That this class here looks like really useful. This is something that I would actually, actually want to have because the suggestion that I started off in the beginning is that maybe initially, if I don't have this point, but I have this point, right? then I'm going to use this point a lot. But then as soon as I see this point, no, actually, I am now a means of picking an age so that I ignore this point or ignore this point, right? So now I can do base op over the, or put my acquisition function through this function instead, right? So the first thing, and this was, you know, this was the big reviewer comments that, that, that we got around this, was saying, cool, so you introduce this latent variable. Now, obviously, what you should do is you should marginalize it out, right? So what you take is you take the prior that you have over this age and you just marginalize it out. So what we're doing then is you're taking all these functions and you're just averaging them back, right? So this is exactly the opposite of what you want to do. Because where we started off, was saying that age should represent this irreducible uncertainty, the things I want to get away from, right? So now if I'm averaging it back in, I'm going to do slightly better, but I'm still going to get something like this, right? This is not what I want. I don't want to add in this uncertainty. So the analogy is, say if you do base opt and you have an additive noise model, well, to the acquisition function, you remove the noise model, right? You explain away something and then you remove it, right? So what is the analogy in this modulated surrogate to get the same thing? Well, the same thing is actually, well, I'll just go straight here. The, the same thing is actually fixing this H to be the prior mean. So in this case, I'm not using H for the values that I predict the new x at. So if I do this, then what I get is that I get something like, this is the marginalized version. And in this case, I fixed for all the values that I predict where I don't have any data, I fixed h to be the prior mean. So let's look at what this means in this case, right? It means that this point here is all alone. It's sitting all alone, which means that this one really fits the prior, 
So this one is going to be used at the moment because there is no discontinuity or anything in this place at the moment. So this one is important for all the points I predict. Down here, I have this very, very narrow, sharply moving structure, which doesn't fit the prior that I said over G. So now it's not going to use all of these points. Some of these points are going to be pushed out in H, so they're going to be a lot less informative for this prediction. So just to show you, so, so this feels like, so how do you then set the distribution of H? So this is basically a tug and pull between the prior over G and the length scale I set over H, right? So these interact a lot, right? So for example, if I fix H and I say there is no variance over H, well, then I'm back to my normal GP like this, and it's going to fit a very, very short length scale, right? Now, if I start adding and allowing variance in H, now I get to model things which look closer to the prior. So initially with a short H, you can see I'm now starting to be allowed to not go through some of the data points. You can then increase H, dum, 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 onto a point where we explain everything in H and nothing using X. So as soon as I explain away H, I have nothing left, right? So just to summarize algorithmically what this actually does. So you define a prior over G. So G is the product space X and Y, X and H. And this prior is over at what granularity do I want to search for the, for the solution? Then you do posterior inference over H. This basically says how informative is this point at the moment. And this is this tug and pull between the prior of saying how much are you allowed to explain away using H and how, because if you're allowed to explain everything, G can always just fit the prior, right? So there's this balance between these two. And then you explain away the irrelevant observations by setting H star to zero, which is the prior mean. And then you compute your acquisition. And now you've computed your acquisition in such a way that you don't take into account all characteristics of the data. Cool. And then you reevaluate H and you just keep looping over this. So, to give you an example, so let's take this hold the table function here. So, we've all seen this. We know how to design Bayesian optimization algorithms that work with this. So, we have lots of different algorithms. They do all reasonably well. So, how about now if we add not noise, but we corrupt this with a deterministic function. If we do this, we get exactly the behavior as before, right? We get this behavior where we get this massive variance dependent on your initial starting condition, because you can never ever remove a data point. You can never ever forget, right? And you can say, well, this should be easy. You should just add noise to this. But if you add noise, you add a global parameter that says, oh, you should always explain away this much, right? Then you're effectively smoothing the function. Well, this is doing it, smoothing it effectively differently everywhere, right? Or you have the capability of doing that. Right, so when one does BO, and this is something that I would like potentially to talk about, when you do BO in real life, how relevant are results on these things? So everyone asks you to run every possible strange function there is in the world. And intuitively, they make sense to me why these things are hard for gradient-based methods. But I'm really not sure how valuable these things are. But we have a long, big table that I'm not going to talk about. But I just want to say we've run this on lots of things, and it generally works. What I wanted to show, which is more, I think, more interesting, is a real example of a robot pushing. So here you have 
a exactly a function looking like this. And the reason for that is that you've got contacts, right? So you have something that's going to vary very, very quickly in certain regions, and it's going to vary very slowly in other regions. And of course, if I could specify the right model for this, standard BO would just work. But if I don't, and I say I want to specify something simpler, such as this modulated circuit, this actually works really well. Cool, so I'm gonna wrap up, but just to hint at some future work, right? So how should you actually set the distribution over this space, right? Because this is really the thing that characterizes how, how, the, um, how the granularity of the search behaves, right? So initially, uh, you can think about actually doing some form of tempering of this variable. So you're actually changing the importance of the structure that you search dependent on the run that you do. You can think about some more sophisticated dependencies between H and X. Is there something that we potentially know that we can actually include by doing this? Um, are there dependencies across age that we can use? So at the moment, we have this one dimensional variable. And the only thing this is allowed to do is to say, oh, this point should not co vary with the other. So let it move away in age. But maybe if you add additional dimensions to age, you can actually come up with really interesting structures of what you want to explain away. So, yes, so by adding additional latent dimensions, you can possibly do new and novel things. So, the paper was uh, published at ICML last year, and uh, I think Eric might be on the talk as well. Um, so, we got quite a lot of additional results in this paper that you can have a look at if you're interested. So, just a brief summary. So Bayesian optimization has done in practice, to me, if I should connect back to the probabilistic numerics ID, it circumvents the modeling challenge by using, by exploiting the characteristics of a non-parametric model. And it does this really nicely and it often works. But the problem is still in the objective function of BO, in the actual Bayesian part, the modeling part, we're still just modeling the function. So this is an issue, and this leads to that we're wasting or spending modeling time on things that are not relevant. And we have a really hard time getting away from data that's actually not relevant anymore. And what we know is that that data can actually be detrimental for your optimization task. So the idea then, as we presented it here, was to introduce these modulated surrogates. So it's somewhat potentially in the right direction of building a BO model. The issue is that we do not have this nice factorization into a model and a likelihood, which we would want, so we can give it the full probabilistic numerics treatment where BO, the whole procedure is your Bayesian inference. We can't do this. What we've done now is kind of combined to a new probabilistic object, this G thing, which is neither here, neither there, but it's at least going in the right direction because we're no longer, we, we believe that we have a better objective to do posterior inference over G than we have over F. Cool, and with that, I am done. Hopefully, I've said enough uh, things that make you upset so that you can now ask me questions and tell me off. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, yes, so thanks a lot for the talk. Uh, you mentioned a lot of names that are in this presentation audience. So I'll see if I can, if anyone has questions. There is a raised hand from Henry. Go ahead, Henry. Oh, no, was it Henry? Yeah. 
No. You're muted, Henry. You're muted. Henry? Um. Henry is gone. Uh, so there is a uh, while he fixes um, is that what? His microphone. Oh, yeah, we can hear you now. Oh, good. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> um, yeah, that was really fascinating, fascinating talk. And we've been kind of thinking about similar problems, but uh, in the context of scaling up based optimization. So yeah. we're using kind of sparse Gaussian processes, and part of that is choosing where your interesting points are. Yeah. So that kind of gives you a mechanism in a similar way to what you're describing to actually not choose some points if they're somehow harmful. Um, and because we have kind of a fixed modeling capacity to like direct that in the right locations. Um, so I was wondering if you kind of thought about, about that at all and how that, that sort of ideas relate to this work. I, th I, th I think that's, uh, that's absolutely right, right? Where the, the key thing though, is that I wonder how you circumvent the problem of when you're doing inference over the, when you're trying to fit the inducing point, your variational bound is still max, is still a bound on the marginal likelihood of all data, right? So your objective function is still the same way. But I've seen work, right? There was work a long time ago when people tried to look at, can I move the inducing points to do good predictions in a specific place, right? And, and of course, if you then have a notion of where you want modeling capacity, that sounds like a great way of doing it, right? I th so I, I think it's just the whole notion of just loosening the concept of actually let's not learn the function. Learning the function is this massive overhead for fun, often for finding the minima. It's just one characteristic. But how can we not go the full monte of you saying actually I don't care about the function? Yeah, there's been some kind of work a while ago. Where people kind of hacked the. I guess the, the the objective when you're fitting yeah. the, the sparse GP to try and make it so that you kind of focused a bit in kind of promising areas of space or made sure that your model the the distribution it induced about the the maximum value or whatever was quite focused, yeah. but none of them really seemed to tackle it properly. No, so so I I can give you actually are we still recording? Uh, uh, do, 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 do. Yes. Uh, how about pausing the recording? I, I'm going to say something <laughs> that I don't want recorded. <laughs> sure, I guess. The internet. Um, Victor has a raised hand. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the it's very nice talk. And, and thanks for much mentioning our paper, which is not that much loved in the rest of the world. Um, my my no. question is, when, when you have this basically by adding H, you add a lot of flexibility to your model. Yeah. So what that can lead to typically is overfitting. Uh, and when you have overfitting, I think Bayesian optimization tends to do two things. The first one is to do over exploitation. And the other one is to do random search because it doesn't know where yeah. to look because everything looks, looks equally uh, interesting. So I don't, I don't know how, if you have some intuition about how in practice you manage to, to deal with that problem. Because basically it ends up doing the opposite. The more flexibility, because the H's are independent, look at this thing, right? It effectively leads to underfitting, if you want to, because what the H is doing is that if I had a completely free H, right? I could construct an input space so that the output that you gave me fits exactly the prior, right? So basically it does the other way around, right? This complexity is gonna, gonna allow me to, to, to basically make this fit the prior. But then the key thing then is that because we then remove this information when we put in the acquisition function, the search is not based on this, right? The search will be based initially, right? I, my gut feeling is that this here, this one is H equal to zero in this case, because we've said I have some length scale of G and I really think I should search on this structure, right? This middle one here, this is the one I'm gonna do. So it's not gonna lead to random search, it's gonna lead to the opposite. 
And what that might mean is that it searches less efficiently towards the end, but that's always the case with BO, right? Like when, when you've honed in on a solution, maybe you shouldn't do all this thing about fitting stuff, right? Yeah, there's a very nice paper on switching from, from BO to BFGS. Yeah. It is a, a comforting idea. Yeah. So, so uh, yeah. Um, I guess Victor still has his hand raised, but that's uh, an artifact. So, uh, anyone else has a question? I see no hands raised. I have, I have a question. Okay. I'm, not, I'm not sure I can pose it very clearly. But it appears that this is a, is a, it's a very non-Bayesian thing to do. Like the Bayesian thing is always to model everything. Yeah. It's really wrong to, to throw away yeah. stuff, uh, right? And um, so, so, so my question is sort of, is there a way to think about this using a more, a more complicated model and the, the thing that I'm uh, that I'm afraid of is that you somehow throw out what you're interested in it because you are, you're managing to sort of you, you're you're not really specifying uh, what the what could be wrong with the model but you're rather you sort of you inc you have a null model that can sort of take over but how do you know that it doesn't take over the stuff you're looking for right yeah and that to me that's the that's the that's the fear if you're not willing to specify what would, what does the data generating mechanism really looks like, right? Which yeah. is what, what you have to do as a Bayesian. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree, right? And th this is what I meant what, with the, the fears that you brought up is exactly the right fears, right? The, the, you're absolutely right. And the mechanism that I would need is this likelihood function, right? Because now, now I don't have that. So what can I then say? Well, now we, we think about specifying a prior for search rather than specify. Of course, now in the, in, the, in, the, in the ideal case of BO, where I have the right model, then the utility in the acquisition function is the right thing to do. We know that, right? But when I have the wrong model, all this goes out the window, right? I do know that given enough data, absolutely, I will, a GP will cover pretty much everything that we know, we want, right? But the path there might be too slow, right? So I agree that I think this is definitely not a Bayesian model, the way, the way it's done, right? Because it's excluding the data. It's a noise model if one wants it to. But it's a noise model based on that the quantity of interest is the minima, right? And that noise model, often we think about likelihoods giving us, leading to the noise, right? That's often how people motivate things. Here, that boundary becomes kind of blurred, right? And this is where I have a hard time writing this down as a nation model, effectively. So, so completely agree with all your uh, with with uh, with uh, with the notion of this, and I think this is the practical way of getting around model mismatch, right? Of, of saying, well, I don't have the right model, but I have this model, and I know it can do really well. Can I now balance of actually trying to fit this to the data? It's like basically I have this hammer and I know this hammer works well. Can I somehow turn the problem into that this hammer is useful? <laughs> and that's the that's the yeah, the, the motivation for it. But I think the cool thing would be to, of course, and this is what we want to do, my, you know, the long-term thing is how can we start thinking about it exactly the way as these people do when they write these beautiful models like this, right? This is where we want to do, because the nice thing about this, and if, if you want to see people explain this properly, please have a look at Mike Osborne or, or Philip Henning's talks about this. But the nice thing about this is now everything's just inference, right? And then we know we're doing the right thing, right? The whole procedure 
is, is just the inference. And that should always be our aim, right? Um, all right. Any further question? I think we are slightly uh, over time, but uh, maybe that was the last question then. Uh, and we can thank Carl uh, again. <laughs>